my name is Craig Ritchie and I'm Professor of Psychiatry of Ageing at the University of Edinburgh and I'm also the Director of Brain Health Scotland as well as being Chair of the Scottish Dementia Research Consortium. Uh, my background has been working both as a clinician, as a psychiatrist, uh, people with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of neurodegenerative disease for gosh the last 20-25 years uh, and at the same time working almost you know 50-50 with my academic work which initially started with um, clinical trials, uh, but it has, I guess, maybe in some ways changed also into a more sort of public health policy, epidemiological approach to some of the issues we're facing, particularly around midlife risk of dementia. So I think, you know, we, we, I think we, we're bringing the brain out of the shadows uh, that the rest of the organs have been putting on it for many years. I like to think of brain health in a very, very simple way. Um, if, if one were to maintain a good blood flow and that blood was full of oxygen and full of the right nutrients uh, and overnight the, 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 the waste products that the brain produces during the day are cleared during a great sleep then we'll have a healthy brain it's that simple you know the, the brain's important and there are things we can do to maintain uh, and promote brain health at an individual level so we, we have um, you know witnessed you know, in the history of medicine, where there's uncertainty and the medical profession have, 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 have not been able to provide, um, you know, credible evidence, there's going to naturally spring up a lot of, you know, theories and, and, and ideas being promoted. Um, and I think that those may be well-meaning or, or, or may be not so well-meaning around certain dietary interventions that may be helpful, certain, you know, cognitive apps. If you take this, then you won't get dementia. And, and you know, we see these all the time in, in, in the headlines in the newspapers. Um, now, some of them may be, may, be, may, be, may be right. We don't know that they're not. But it's, it's, I think it's for us, as dare I say, responsible uh, clinicians and academics to, to do all we can to provide credible evidence. The first rule is do no harm. Um, now, if we can do good, that's fantastic, but we certainly should never be doing anything which is knowingly or potentially harmful without, dare say, consent that we think that the, the, the benefit will outweigh, outweigh the harm. And, and I think there are things that are being promoted sometimes in terms of nutrition uh, in particular that may actually, if not necessarily be harmful to the brain, they may be harmful to the individual's well-being from costing a fortune, etc. So I, I, I think it's, it's on us as, as professionals to get credible evidence and communicate that credible evidence in a responsible way. The principles around brain health are identical uh, wherever we live in the world. Uh, what, 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 we are more similar to each other than we are different, irrespective of where we live or who we worship or you know, you know, how we feel about the, the universe. Um, the principles that I mentioned the principles of you know good good blood supply, um, you know good nutrition, uh, good oxygen supply, good sleep. You know those are going to apply no matter where you live in the world and, and no matter what age you are. Also, now how you help individuals achieve that may be slightly different between different healthcare settings. You know, for instance, in in low and middle income countries, some of the capacity to provide individualized care may not be where it is in say Scotland or, or other sort of more um, you know higher income uh, settings but it, but, it, but, it, but, it, but we've also got a huge amount to learn from other countries in the world where maybe they haven't been overly biased towards the medical model and high-tech medicine because they can't they're excellent at public health so a lot of the public health initiatives that um, we'll be undertaking here in Scotland for instance could learn a lot from low and middle income countries, because that's main that's the mainstay of what they can they can do to help uh, mitigate uh, disease, particularly chronic disorders. So I think there's there's um, there's different ways we can deliver services, and there's an awful lot we can learn from each other. But the principles are identical wherever we live in the world. Digital health is is, is such a, it's a massively broad concept. I mean, you you have everything from you know detection methodologies using you know um, apps on smartphones um, but also using you know big data sets that may come from you know other sources um, that will be indicative uh, of, of, of changes in brain health I'm, I'm, I'm thinking particularly about a study recently which looked at you know GPS data Canadian study 
uh, and showed that people who are amyloid positive were, you know, taking more turns to, 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 to complete a journey and were also less likely to drive at night. And there was a real world assessment using, you know, GPS data um, that, that indicated maybe there was something uh, on towards with somebody's um, brain health. Another thing that we're particularly interested in is speech. You know, how can we use speech, which is a good, digitalize the speech, we codify it, we analyze it using, you know, AI approaches. So I think those are the things for early detection where I think we can use, we can use digital solutions. The other thing that I think is, is really helpful with the digital world is um, how we can use um, digital support tools for behavioral modification. So behavioral scientists are working very closely with app developers. And we've got, again, some, some work going on here, which look at if I see someone in a clinic and say, like, I think you should do X, Y, or Z in terms of you know, lifestyle changes. If you just leave it there and hope these changes take place, then you're probably going to be uh, dissatisfied. But if you can help support people through, through digital solutions to maintain that behavioral modification, and I think that is, is certainly a route that we, we want to pursue.